Hello everyone and welcome to today's Law Path webinar. My name is Ryan Tan and today we're going to be going through some expert tips to secure the best deal when buying or selling a business. Now this is very exciting because this is a new topic for us on the webinar series and again we are going to be going through uh, buying and selling businesses. It is quite a common thing especially with small businesses. Uh, on one hand we have a lot of businesses who are looking to enter an industry and they're looking to do that through an acquisition of an existing business. There are other businesses as well who are looking to sell business and they've come to the end of their lifespan. So again, phenomenal topic to get into, uh, very valuable for the audience today. We do have a range of documents on the Law Path platform as well. We have a business sale agreement, we have a term sheet. Uh, and again, joining us will be Sam Bowen. He's one of our expert lawyers who deals with our legal advice plan customers. And he's gonna be going through the expert tips uh, because as you can imagine, when you do sell or buy a business, there are many things to look at in terms of doing your due diligence to ensuring that again, not only do you just hand over the keys and taken over the business, uh, but you've looked at things like your compliance from your directorship, uh, you know, you're looking at any liabilities that are in the business and that, you know, might continue to be a problem uh, with things going uh, down the track, like debts incurred, et cetera. So Sam will go through all of these tips on the presentation. Just covering off today's agenda briefly, uh, we'll go through an asset sale versus a share sale. So potentially you're looking to sell shares in the business versus selling assets, uh, how you can go about it and which is the best one for you. We'll go through some initial steps as well. So valuation and what methodologies you can use to evaluate a business, uh, financial records, contracts and confidentiality clauses, which is very important. Thirdly, on the sale of assets, so the process and the issue of those assets, and again, on the sale of shares, the process and the issue of those shares, and then lastly, when trouble hits, so if you do have issues, what remedies you can rely on to protect yourself, uh, and again, best practices in general. Now, if you do have any questions from today's presentation, we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please pop them in the Q&A box, and Sam will be delighted to answer them at the end of the presentation. Just briefly on LawPath, uh, who we are and what we do. So we are an online digital legal platform and we provide on-demand legal help for small businesses. We do this through our contract management software. So likely you've all seen our 400 documents, templates that we have with e-signature, which allow you to not only create, but to sign and store them securely as well. And over the last eight years in operation, we've helped over... 10,000 Australian businesses, um, we've helped, you know, $100 million in legal fees saved. And uh, we've got a lot of five-star reviews on Trustpilot and Google as well. So we're just getting started on our mission. We have lots of improvements to come on the platform. So now I'm going to introduce Sam. Uh, like I mentioned before, he's an expert lawyer who serves our legal advice plan clients. And he's also a regular on the webinar series. So without further ado, uh, I'll kick it off to you, Sam, to take it away uh, for today's presentation. Great. Thanks for that, Ryan. And thank you, everyone, for joining the, uh, the webinar. Um, if you just flip, flip to the next slide. All right. So the first thing that we're going to cover is um, the difference between asset sales and share sales. And it's a pretty fundamental difference um, because if you're selling your business assets, um, the, the entity that's actually carrying on the business changes, right? So what you're doing is you're transferring the assets which make up the business um, from the entity that from the entity that uh, that carried on the business to a new entity, uh, which will be either the purchaser or a company that the purchaser has um, has has formed. Um, whereas if you're selling shares, then you've you've got the same entity that's carrying out the business, but the shares that comprise that company um, gets transferred to a new owner. So. Um, when you're selling assets, obviously that it, that comprise, comprises uh, plant and equipment, um, any registered business name, licenses, permits, um, which are typically not assignable, or at least you have to go through through a through a bit of a process to to get them assigned. Um, goodwill of the business, intellectual property, customer lists, stock inventory, and contracts, and so on. And then with the sale of shares, it's basically just the shares in the company. Now, obviously, if you're selling shares, um, the entity that's carrying on the business has to be a company. Um, you can't um, you can't be a sole trader or a partnership uh, in, a, in a share sale. Um, so if the if you're operating a business as a sole trader or in a partnership, then the only way you can sell your business is by way of assets. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, so sale of assets, the advantages for the seller is that you can pick and choose which assets you want to sell. So there might be some assets that you want to keep for maybe a future business that you want to run. Um, so you can pick and choose the, the, uh, the assets that will form part of the sale. Um, and there are generally fewer warranties that the vendor has to give, uh, fewer indemnities compared with the sale of shares. And GST doesn't apply if the sale is of a going concern. And we'll go through what that means later on in a, in a different slide. Um, the disadvantages from the seller's point of view is that, the, that you retain any liabilities um, of the business. Um, so they don't, they don't travel along to the, to the purchaser. Um, generally speaking, all the assets that comprise of the business um, will, oh, sorry, hang on a second. Uh, I think that that second point, sorry, there's an error here, that second point on, under the heading of disadvantages shouldn't be there. Um, if the sale is not a going concern, um, and so you don't meet the criteria of the sale being, being of a going concern, then GST will apply. Um, stamp duty applies um, if the assets of the business comprise real real properties, so other than land, um, as well as um, goods of a goods uh, of a certain value. So there is a in New South Wales at least um, there are rules around calculating whether stamp duty is available on the on the transfer of uh, business assets, um, whether it's due how how much of the assets uh, comprise of duty of the property and so on. Um, and uh, you generally have to deal with the rigmarole of transferring employees, um, as well as transferring over suppliers and clients, um, or signing of leases for premises and so on. So it's a bit of a, a bit of an involved process. Um, you typically find that the, the, the bigger the, the sale value, um, the, the, sorry, the bigger the purchase price in, a, in an asset sale, the more complex it is and, and the higher the legal fees, um, the legal fees and expenses tend to track uh, pretty evenly uh, as, the, as the value of the, the transaction goes up. Uh, whereas in a, in a share sale, um, it tends to be a little bit less complex. Uh, next slide. Sale of shares. So the advantages for the seller is that all the shares uh, in the company, as well as all the debts and liabilities, they are transferred over to the new owner, or at least the new shareholder. Um, GST usually doesn't apply to the sale of shares. There's an exemption um, for what's called financial supply, the GST law. Um, employees, suppliers, clients, they all remain with the company. And it's, it's, remember, it's the same entity that's still creating the business. So the employer, for the purpose of employment law, the employer stays, stays the same. Um, if it, when you're dealing with suppliers, you as the client, the customer, you remain the, the, the same entity. Um, and the client, and your clients, the business's clients are also dealing with the same supplier. Um, so usually there is no need to re-sign contracts, um, although there are some contracts um, that have uh, provisions around, um, uh, you know, the, the change in shareholdings. Uh, if, if it's of a, of a significant um, change, then uh, it might constitute an assignment that you need to go through consent process and so on. But usually, usually the, the contracts don't need to be re-signed. And stamp duty normally doesn't apply in the transfer of shares unless the business is what's called a land rich, sorry, unless the company is what's called a land rich company. And we'll go through the definition of that later on as well. Um, the disadvantages from the seller's point of view is that because the liabilities remain in the company, the buyer, uh, the purchaser will want to do uh, very in-depth due diligence um, on the particularly the financial and taxation uh, aspects of the company um, and uh, this might discourage some buyers um, the buyers will also want a, a fairly extensive list of warranties and indemnities from the vendor um, and there are some as I mentioned before some contracts which treat um, the change in shareholdings um, in the company as being an assignment or a transfer and that contract might prohibit an assignment uh, or will only permit an assignment uh, with, with consent. So just got to, got to watch out for that pitfall. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we're just going to go through the initial steps um, that apply to both types of sales um, before we deep dive into specific considerations for asset sales, considerations for share sales. So initial steps. Well, number one is to value your business. How much are you going to actually get out of it? And there are a few different types of valuations, uh, valuation methods that we can go through. Um, as lawyer, as a lawyer, I'm not um, well suited to advising people on how to value the business. That's more of a question for you know, an experienced business accountant or a 
for a business valuer, uh, but we'll run through some, some basic methods for calculating the value of a business. The next step after that would usually be to engage a business broker to list your business for sale and attract some buyers. Um, and then once uh, there is a, a prospective buyer, then you'll have to um, negotiate on things like confidentiality, some broad heads of agreement on how that, on how the sale transaction might proceed, um, a payment of you know, certain sums of holding deposits, maybe exclusively for that for that prospective purchaser, and so on. Um, and then once the the confidentiality and, and heads of agreement is is dealt with, then you make some disclosures so that the prospective buyer can do some due diligence. Um, and then once the prospective buyer is happy with everything, um, then you will negotiate the, the nuts and bolts of the actual sale and prepare the contract of sale, whatever, the, whatever form that takes, whether it's sale of assets or sale of shares. So on to the next slide. Um, so some basic methods for valuing a business um, really depends on the, the type of business and the industry, um, the, the, the method that you choose. Um, Probably the most straightforward method is an asset-based valuation. You basically look at all of the, the, the market value of the assets that the business holds. Um, it's probably suitable for businesses that are very rich in physical assets like equipment, um, but probably not appropriate if the assets are primarily intellectual property or they form professional services because those type of businesses, first of all, intellectual property is very difficult to value. Um, and as for professional services, um, that the value of the business really attached to the goodwill provided by the professional services um, person, you know, the professional be it an accountant or a lawyer or an engineer and so on. Um, so it's good for some businesses, but for not good for a lot of other businesses. Uh, perhaps a more common method is a return on investment. So um, you look at the net profit generated by the business and then you multiply it by some factor. Classical factor is three, so three times the annual net, net profit. Uh, but it does vary a lot depending on the type of business and industry. So here at LawPath, we, we deal with a lot of um, sort of high growth tech startups and you know, they have crazy multipliers, you know, 60, uh, 50, 40, 30. Um, it, it depends on the, on the type of business um, and, the, uh, and the industry that they're operating in. Um, and then the other method is comparable sales. So you look at similar types of businesses, the same industry, location, same sort of size in terms of employment, in terms of revenue, and see how and see what those businesses have been sold for. Uh, next slide. Right. Um, so confidentiality or heads of agreement. Now these are two different types of agreements. Um, a confidentiality agreement or, or a confidentiality deed is a, a legal agreement that just deals with confidentiality obligations. So you typically have a party called a discloser um, and a, another party called a recipient. Um, so in the purchase, in the sale of a, in the sale of a business, the vendor would typically be the discloser of confidential info, and the recipient uh, will um, promise that they will not disclose that confidential info to a third party without the discloser's consent. Uh, that they won't use that confidential information uh, to the detriment of the discloser um, and for their own good. Um, and uh, there, there may be some some exceptions and carve outs around that. So. Uh, legally obliged to disclose confidential information to a government authority and you know, by, by a court order, then, then there might be an exception provided for it. Um, but more often, uh, parties would enter into a heads of agreement. So this is a, a broader agreement, um, which includes, typically includes confidentiality provisions, um, as well as other provisions like uh, treatment of intellectual property. Um, whether the purchaser is able to exclusively negotiate on this uh, prospective sale um, for a set period of time, whether, whether the prospective purchaser has to pay a holding deposit, which is a, which is usually a token sum, uh, maybe $1,000 or $5,000 thereabouts, um, and uh, commitment to pay the vendor's legal costs if they choose not to proceed. Um, now, uh, if the purchaser wants uh, some sort of exclusive right to negotiate for a set period of time, maybe two months or three months, so that they can do some initial due diligence and then negotiate the terms of the sale, um, then it's also normal for the purchase to pay a holding deposit in exchange for that. Um, and so once the parties have negotiated either a confidential agreement and enter into it or a heads of agreement, um, then they'll then proceed to, um, to negotiating the, the finer details of the sale. Um, now, just one note about the heads of agreement. Typically, heads of agreement are not legally binding. 
but some clauses can be expressly made legally binding. So you would want the confidentiality provision to be legally binding. Uh, same with intellectual property, exclusively um, anything to do with deposits and money. Um, those um, those particular clauses will need to be legally binding. The other clauses are more there as a guide for negotiation when you um, when you're working out the the terms of the sale agreement. Next uh, slide. Um, okay, so once the heads of agreement have been entered into, or once the confidentiality agreement has been entered into, um, the purchaser will then request some disclosure documents. Now, um, there are lots of business sales that, that take place across Australia, um, and so there is a bit of a convention established around what disclosure documents are expected, typically, um, and so they'll normally be financial records. Um, the typical request is for records going back two full financial years and uh, the year to the, the current financial year to date. Um, so they would uh, comprise of profit and loss statements, balance sheets, um, uh, cash flow statements. Um, so initially you'd supply those. Sometimes uh, purchaser purchases will request for things like bank statements. Just think about whether you do want to disclose that or not. Um, might be a bit sensitive, um, as well as you know, in terms of any loans and so on. Um, the list of employees, uh, this is an important one, especially for asset sales, because when it, when it comes to sale of assets, remember that the employer entity is gonna change. Um, and so employees are, are basically gonna get terminated. And be, and if, they, if any of those employees are going to continue on with the, with the new, with the, with the purchaser, then the purchaser would have to offer contracts of employment to those employees. And so um, you need to disclose who the employee, who your employees are, what their roles are, commencement dates, accrual awards, pay rates, and the accrual, very importantly, the accrual of entitlements, leave, um, parental leave, personal service, personal carers leave, long service leave, and so on. Um, and the, the parties need to factor uh, potential payouts to the employees um, as a result, due to their entitlements. Um, the list of suppliers, uh, works in progress. Now you don't have to hand over actual contracts, but um, typically what will happen is you, you prepare a spreadsheet of who your, cust who your key customers are. Not every customer, but who your key customers are, key suppliers are, and works in progress. Um, and so if you're, it works in progress, it's applicable if you're, a, if you're doing any kind of service provision um, that goes on for a period of time, um, then you, 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 you disclose the work in progress, specify which one will be completed before the completion of the, of the sale, uh, which one will carry over after the completion of the sale and have to be taken over by the, by the purchaser and make some adjustments around that. Um, the lease of premises is another key disclosure. So typically you, you would actually give them a copy of the lease itself um, as well as the landlord's contact details and the contact details of the landlord's solicitor. Um, and go through the and and be familiarize yourself with the requirements for for obtaining the landlord's consent. In most leases, um, you're not allowed to assign the lease, or in other words, transfer the lease to another party without the landlord's consent. And the lease agreement would set out provisions specifying what steps you need to take to get the landlord's consent, what sort of information you need to provide, and so on, um, as well as the payment of the landlord's costs. Um, so lease of premises, important disclosure, and other disclosures you might need to make uh, include things like current legal disputes that are on foot, um, leases of equipment, uh, registration details of vehicles if they're forming part of the sale, intellectual property rights, um, domain names, and so on and so on. Next slide. Um, and so once those disclosures have been made, um, the purchase has looked into it, they're quite happy with it, um, then you negotiate this, the, the actual sale agreement. Now, the purchaser might not go through the whole uh, due diligence process before entering to a sale agreement, right? So, so they might look at the financials to begin with, uh, and then once they're, they're satisfied with the financials, then you would typically, the, sorry, the, the financials and the lease, uh, lease of premises, then uh, you would typically move on to negotiating the sale of agreement. Um, and, and that's when you might start making disclosures about employees and so on. Um, and with the sale agreement, that there would, there would typically be an initial period um, where the purchaser will do further, more in-depth due diligence. Um, and then there will be a, a trigger point 
uh, once they passed, once the, the that in, that further due diligence has uh, has been done, um, then the parties would, would uh, take certain steps to work towards completion of the sale. Um, you know, negotiate with the landlord about transfer transfer of the lease or obtaining a new lease and so on. Um, working out um, uh, what to do with employees uh, and things like that, um, and then before before progr progressing on to, on to completion. So, but um, common across both um, the asset sales and share sales, um, the sale agreement should talk about uh, the payment of a deposit, um, typically be uh, a much more substantial sum than the holding deposit. Um, it's typically around about 10%, although I've seen figures up to about 20 as well. Bigger than 20 is probably unreasonable. Um, payment of the purchase price, how it's going to be paid. Um, so is it going to be paid in one lump sum or is the vendor going to allow the payments to be delayed, paid, to be paid in installments? So that's typically called vendor finance. So the vendor will grant, um, uh, essentially it's basically like a loan um, for the purchase to pay uh, the purchase price at a later date. Um, sometimes the delayed payment is by way of what's called earnout. So as the business operates, it generates a profit, and then that profit is then then channeled over to the the vendor um, towards the payment of the purchase price. So now, if if the delayed payment is going to be by way of earnout, then you're going to have to consider how that's actually going to be calculated, um, and you have to think about well, what's going to happen if the if the project if the actual profits um, are a lot less than uh, than what was anticipated. Um, typically speaking, um, the vendor would have to wear it um, unless if the purchase has clearly um, been incompetent in the running of their business and you have to look into you know, whether there are unusual expenses that have been incurred and things like that uh, with dealing with that payments. Um, directors guarantees as well. So if the purchase is a company, um, then its directors should provide personal guarantees. If it's a subsidiary of a holding company, then the holding company should also guarantee its subsidiary. Um, next next uh, slide. All right, so now we're going to look at um, the, the details of a sale, sorry, of a sale of uh, assets. Uh, next slide. Um, and probably the most complicated, one of the most more, more complicated issues um, in asset sales is what to do with employees. So the employer changes. Um, and so under our employment laws, the employment with the previous, with, with the vendor entity uh, will be terminated. Um, and the employees will need to be given due notice of their termination in accordance with the applicable award and the national employment standards, um, or they must be paid in lieu of that notice. Um, and the purchaser may offer new contracts of employment to those employees that it wishes to retain. Um, now, normally in practice, the purchaser would make it clear what they want to do in the contract, right? So the purchaser will say, uh, that we will issue contracts to blah, blah, blah employees on terms that are no, um, no less favorable than their existing employment contract. Now, it, it does have to be, the new offer does have to be on terms that are no less favorable. Um, because if the purchaser issues really bad employment contracts, right, that are comparatively worse, and the employee looks at it and just says, well, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sign off to that. Uh, I'd rather just go and find, some, find somewhere else to work. Um, then that employee would be made, essentially they'll be made redundant um, and maybe eligible to be paid redundancy uh, payment as well. So the, the, the contract should say, that um, the purchaser's offer of employment has to be on terms that are no less favorable. Uh, because if it is no less favorable and the employee then rejects it, then it is a resignation of redundancy. They've, they've just chosen to, to go and leave on their own accord. Um, and so therefore, they, they would be entitled to redundancy. Um, now, if the purchaser doesn't, sorry, there's a typo there, uh, purchaser doesn't want to retain any employees, the vendor must pay out the entitlements or the accrued leave and so on, and any redundancy pay if the employee is eligible to get redundancy pay. Uh, and usually it'll be done at the uh, vendor's own cost. If the purchaser is willing to retain employees, then it's got to make a decision on what, on whether it's going to um, recognize prior service with the vendor for the purpose of annual leave and redundancy. Um, now, the purchaser has to recognize prior service for long service leave, uh, sick leave, uh, carer's leave, and, and parental leave. 
but they do have the option of choosing whether to recognise prior, prior service for annual relief and redundancy. If they choose not to recognise prior service, then the vendor will have to pay out those accrued entitlements. Um, if, the, if the purchaser chooses to recognise prior service, then the vendor would allow an adjustment in favour of the purchaser for wearing that, that, that burden, that the, the, those accrued entitlements. Um, in, in New South Wales, I'm not sure about other states, the standard form uh, contract for sale of business uh, drafted by the Law Society of New South Wales has an, has an option so that if the vendor makes an adjustment, then the adjustment is reduced by 30%. And that's just to take into account the fact that when the purchaser um, pays these entitlements to the, to the employee, um, it's, uh, they'll get a tax deduction. So 30% so is, is sort of estimates, is a rough estimate of what that tax deduction might be. And so the, so the allowance will typically be reduced by 30%, uh, but that is an option that you actually have to select on the, on the, on the, on the contract itself. Um, so that's employees, next slide. Uh, the other big issue is the assignment of the lease of premises. Um, now, the, per the purchaser, once they have a look at the lease agreement, they'll have to make a decision on whether they want to transfer the existing lease or obtain a new lease if they don't like the terms of the existing lease. Or if the existing lease has already expired, um, then they uh, would want a new lease um, and there will be set procedures set out in the lease agreement about obtaining landlord's consent. Um, from the vendor's perspective, um, if the lease is being transferred, uh, the vendor, the purchaser and the landlord would have to, would have to enter into a deed of assignment of lease. Um, if the lease is being surrendered, so if the, if the purchaser chooses to take out a new lease, the vendor would surrender the existing lease. Um, and so the vendor and the, and the landlord would sign on to a deed of surrender. And um, the, that deed of surrender should also include clauses releasing the uh, vendor from any obligations uh, in, in respect of the lease after the, the, the completion date of the sale of the business. Um, just remember that, especially if you're running a company, um, typically landlords will require director's guarantees and those director's guarantees typically don't end with the end of the lease. So they will continue on. Um, and so you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to have these dangling legal obligations. Um, so, so you want the, the deed of surrender to release not just uh, the company, but also your personal guarantees as well. Um, there will be there is some nominal stamp duty that you've got to pay um, on on the assignment of the lease. Uh, sorry, on the surrender of the lease. Uh, if the deed is being if the lease is being assigned, typically the purchaser will have to pay whatever stamp duty needs to be paid. Um, inventory and stock take. So if you're running, let's say, a retail business uh, and you've got a whole load of inventory, um, typically you would factor the value of that inventory into account when calculating the purchase price. Um, and the expectation is that uh, there would be a stock take close to the close to the date of completion. So you've got to decide when that stock take is going to take place. Uh, typically, it's about a week or so, um, week maybe two weeks, depending on depending on uh, the gap in time between signing the uh, sale agreement and the completion date. Uh, but typically it's around about, about, about a week. Um, and yeah, so you would either get representatives from both parties doing a joint stock take, or you would appoint an independent person to do a stock take. Um, and then they would, they, would, uh, value, they would work out how much stock is actually there. And if the amount of stock held is actually less then what was it, what was anticipated when the purchase price was originally decided? Then there would have to be an adjustment made in favor of the purchase price, uh, in, in favor of the purchaser, um, essentially discounting the purchase price. Um, also, got to consider vendor assistance and introductions. So remember, the entity carrying on the business is changing with um, with the sale of business assets, and so um, the the, vent, the purchaser will, might need training from the vendor um, on how to carry on the business properly, um, might need introductions to key customers and suppliers. So, so typically it will be like a, a nice little letter drafted up by the vendor saying, hey, we've just uh, sold our business and uh, we've got this wonderful person who's, uh, who's just taking over the business, really great guy, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
might even be personal introductions, depending on depending on how important that customer or supplier is. Uh, next slide. And there's more considerations too. Um, so business name. Uh, so if there's a registered business name, um, then that would have to be transferred. Um, typically, the vendor would go log onto the Asset Connect website um, and get a get a, a key code um, that's used by the purchaser to then transfer that business name over to whatever entity they're gonna they're gonna use to operate the business. Um, online accounts such as you know your Google accounts, Microsoft accounts, um, and so on, that would have to be uh, transferred over. Um, typically, it's just handing over the login credentials and getting the purchase to update the account details. Um, in practice, most of the time, the, the, the vendor and purchaser will sit down together and actually go through this process. Um, telephone, internet utilities, vendor would have to disconnect, purchaser would have to arrange new connections. Um, tax implications, before you enter into any agreement for sale of business, um, whether it's an SSL or share sale, get advice from your business accountant. Um, and I say business accountant because uh, not all accountants are familiar with how businesses operate and taxes related to business sales. So get a bit, so if, you're, if your regular accountant is not um, a specialist in business um, related accounting, then get a business accountant to go through it with you. Um, and another big consideration is GST. So uh, the sale price doesn't attract GST if the sale is a going concern. And what that means is the purchase is registered or required to be registered for GST. The contract has to say that the supply is of a going concern. Uh, the vendor has to continue operating the business up to the time of completion. If the vendor stops running the business uh, and the business is not being run for like a month, then that is not a, that is not a going concern. Um, and GST will apply. Um, and the vendor must supply all things necessary for the continued operation of the business. So if the vendor fails to supply a piece of equipment uh, or fails to provide or arrange for a new, for, a, for the transfer of a lease, then again, not a, not a, not a, not a concern and, and GST will have to be paid. Um, and the contract should have a clause that says that if GST is payable, um, then GST is to be added on top of the purchase price. The purchase price should not be taken to include GST. Um, next slide. Okay, sale of shares. Got to go through some issues for consideration. Um, now, as I said before, only businesses which operate as a company can conduct a share sale. Um, the three main documents that you need would be a share sale agreement. Uh, if there are multiple shareholders, um, then you need a shareholders agreement and a deed of accession. Uh, the company may also have a constitution. A constitution is not an absolutely it is not an absolute necessity uh, by law for proprietary companies, uh, but you might have one. Um, so these documents will need to be provided to to the buyer, right? So they know what the constitution of the company is, what they're actually signing up for in terms of the governing rules of the company um, and any shareholders they have to sign up for as well. Um, after completion of a share sale, um, the purchaser, typically it'll just be the one purchaser that they will become the, the owner of that company. Um, if there are multiple multiple purchasers buying shares, then they will, they will join to become a shareholders in the company. Um, now, the company runs the business uh, and all the contracts that, that it has entered into with customers and suppliers will remain as they are, um, except you've got to be careful of those contracts that have a clause um, which says that if the company's shareholdings change or the control of the company changes, um, then it is, um, then it will be taken to be an assignment. Uh, and there might be a separate clause saying that an assignment of the contract is uh, prohibited. Um, unless the, the, it receives content, consent of the other party. So just, just have a look through your contracts um, and just watch out for those clauses because if those clauses exist, then you're going to have to liaise with the other party in the contract to, um, to get a new contract signed, um, signed with the company after the completion of the sale. Next slide. Um, stamp duty is typically not payable on sale of shares unless the company is land rich. Um, now, I'm not sure whether this definition is consistent across all the states and territories. Stamp duty law is state and territory law, not commonwealth law. So it does, it can vary between states. Um, in New South Wales, uh, a company is land rich if it owns land with an unencumbered value. So 
minus any money owing on mortgages and so on, um, of $2 million or more. Um, and that includes the value of improvements such as buildings. Uh, in previously, I think it was prior to 2020, it used to be unimproved value, but that, that, that's now changed to unencumbered value of $2 million or more. So if, um, if, if the company is land rich and shares are being sold in the company, um, then uh, stamp duty is payable. And I think there is a threshold uh, you know, if you, if you cross a, a percentage threshold in terms of the shareholdings that are being sold, uh, then stamp duty will be payable on the sale, sale of the shares. Typically, GST is not payable on the purchase price um, of sale of shares because there is an exemption provided in the GST regulations. There are also some caveats um, to that as well, but, but in, in the overwhelming majority of cases, there'll be no GST payable. Um, and the company will usually retain all of its assets and liabilities upon sale. Um, and so the purchaser will need to do very, very thorough due diligence, especially in relation to finances and tax, and also on any, um, on any threatened or current litigation. Um, and the, the list of warranties that you get from the vendor should, should cover all of that. Tax, tax compliance, um, any legal disputes you know, that, the, that the vendor has disclosed or threatened uh, and current legal disputes in relation to the company. Blah, 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 blah. And there's usually a very long list of warranties. Share sale of Next slide. Uh, sorry, next slide. Um, so yeah, um, basic uh, documents relating to sale of shares, company constitution, if there is one, Shareholders agreement, uh, deed of a session. Uh, now, some people ask me what the difference is between a constitution and a shareholders agreement. So a company constitution is, a, is a, a, a document of rules setting out how the company is to be governed, how meetings are to be held, um, what rights are attached to different classes of shares and so on. It binds the company, all of the shareholders and the directors um, automatically. Whereas shareholders agreements are a binding contract between the shareholders and the company, not the directors. Um, and it can go a bit, a bit deeper into some of the government governance issues, um, but it's mostly concerned with how the shares are dealt with. So how the shares can be issued, how they're sold, how they're bought. Um, it talks about preemptive rights. So if an existing shareholder wants to sell his shares, to sell his or her shares, um, you know, whether, um, the, that that shareholder needs to give the other shareholders notice and give them the opportunity to buy their shares before a third party and so on and so on. Um, the deed of a session is uh, usually a template deed that's attached to the back of the shareholders agreement. Um, and it's a document that a new, new incoming shareholder signs to say that they'll be bound by the existing shareholders agreement. Um, and all of these documents, they need to comply with the Corporation Act. All right, so what happens when things go wrong? Next slide. Um, so with contracts, generally speaking, um, you, book, you can either terminate a contract or you can rescind it. Um, termination is a remedy for when a party um, fails to comply with their obligations under the contract. Um, and once, you, once the contract is terminated, um, then you sue. The, the party who is in breach for damages, uh, which is the loss that's incurred by the innocent party due to the other party's failure. Um, whereas with rescission, the contract is um, taken to have not been entered into at all. Um, and so the remedy that the courts will give is to, is what's called restitution, is to return uh, the innocent party, or to return actually both parties to their pre-contract position. Um, depending on, on why the contract's been rescinded, if it's been rescinded due to, um, uh, mis uh, due to misleading the set of conduct in, in certain settings, um, then there might be statutory remedies available for damages as well as, as restitution. Um, now, in contracts, uh, you would typically have terms, uh, or so, sorry, you typically have warranties um, and you would have also what's called essential terms or essential provisions. Um, now, the warranties don't allow, typically they don't allow a party to terminate the contract, but it does allow the party to uh, sue the other party for damages if those warranties are breached. So the vendor might, so as the vendor, you might give a whole bunch of warranties about your business. 
um, you know, you might say, for instance, that uh, there is no pending or anticipated litigation in relation to your business. But then it turns out that you actually knew that there was a, a threat of litigation by maybe an ex-employee, um, and but you hit that fact. Um, so that warranty has obviously been breached. The um, now now that is also a misleading set of conduct, and, and it would allow rescission. But let's say that the the, um, the purchaser didn't rescind, and they they continued on with the purchase. They can still sue you for damages, right? So if the if the uh, if the purchase if the company or the purchaser, um, sorry, if the company, if it was a company share sale, um, ended up having to pay you know, this, this disgruntled ex-employee a, a certain sum of compensation, um, then the, the, the purchaser could sue you for, for that compensation to, to be reimbursed that. Um, so you've got warranties um, that usually don't allow termination, but do allow claims for damages. Um, and then you've got uh, what's called conditions or essential terms that do allow for termination. And they're usually much more serious breaches. Um, and they tend to go to the, the heart of the contract. Um, typically speaking, if, if you had known that, that those um, provisions, those, those obligations would not be complied with, you probably would not have entered the contract in the first place. And so that entitles you to terminate um, and then the, the remedy for termination can be damages. With rescission, um, rescission is something that you can normally do if, you, if there's been some fraud, fraudulent uh, misrepresentation um, and the courts will try and return the parties to their pre-contract positions. Um, and I think that's about the last slide. Uh, okay, I'll hand you back to Ryan. Perfect, thank you so much, Sam, for the very comprehensive uh, presentation. Now we, can, we do get a lot of questions on business sale and business purchase as well. So just understanding how LawPath can help. As I mentioned previously, we have a contract management system, which does include a business sale agreement, as well as a term sheet for the sale of business. We found that about 80% of individuals and 87% of small to medium businesses can find it difficult to access legal services. Uh, they have a perception that is inaccessible for them. It can be costly, expensive, and time consuming. And that's where we come in to make the process a lot easier. So how LawPath can help is firstly through the contract management system of 400 templates and e-signature built in. You can create these documents, you can sign them, send them to third parties, and then store them safely in the platform. We also have personalized workflows. So let's say you're purchasing a business and you're looking to hire some employees, you're looking to uh, you know, collect a debt you're looking to terminate some employees or hire contractors. We have workflows built out for all of those steps. There's a few other ones as well, and we're constantly developing more. And then lastly, booking in legal consultations. So on our platform, which I'll go through just after this, we do have a service called our legal advice plan, which does provide you unlimited 30 minute calls with our lawyers each month on new topics. This does actually include a four page document review for the majority of documents. So you can review a business sale agreement, look over a term sheet, get some more information on these as well. And you can book in these consultations anytime on the platform. So just looking through our document library, we've taken our business sale agreement. I've got a free sample just on the screen so you can see what it looks like. Everything in the yellow is stuff that you can customize. So up the top here, you can see you can add your business logo and your business address. And then all these little uh, Squares is where you can insert information. Now, our contract management system does this through asking you a series of questions. When you answer these questions, for example, what is the ABN of the seller, the ABN of the buyer, uh, what's the business name and the date, et cetera, that does pre-fill the document with all the information so that you don't have to worry about knowing where to put it. You don't need any legal expertise. It's super simple to fill out. And through this business sale agreement, we do have uh, a number of clauses in there, such as confidentiality, uh, employees, restraint clause, et cetera. A lot of these clauses are dynamic, which means that if you don't need them, you can select no or remove them. And the document does pre-fill itself uh, for you. So it is customized for your business and you can dial it up or dial it down depending on your needs as well. So just taking a look at the plans here, we have our legal advice plan on the left. It's $120 per month. Like I mentioned, it does give you unlimited 30 minute calls per month with our lawyers on new topics. So as long as it's a new specific scenario, you can talk about that in a business and commercial context on the plan. 
these calls can be on phone, so via a standard phone call, via video call on our website. And we do have a lawyer chat for basic questions which don't need a consultation. If you have uh, things that you want to clarify quickly, you can jump on any time and get an answer within uh, one business day. Now, again, like I mentioned, we do have a four-page document review. So if you do need to review, uh, say, an employment agreement or you have some company documents, uh, potentially you've got a services agreement that you'll be issuing out once you purchase the business. These can all be reviewed on the plan up to four pages. And this is verbal advice. So the lawyers can go through it, give you a bit of knowledge and information. If you do want to proceed on to reviewing more than four pages or look at some contract drafting, that is eligible through uh, a quotation from our lawyers. And because you're on the plan, you would receive some form of discount, uh, which the lawyers will quote you as well. Now, on the right-hand side, we do have our legal and accounting advice plan. Now, this is backed by our friends at Pop Business. They're chartered accountants, so highly specialized. They do a lot of work around taxation planning, uh, you know, asset protection, group structuring, going through all of these sophisticated uh, topics as well to ensure that you're protected from an accounting standpoint. We do provide uh, ASIC and ATO agent services as well. So if you do require to make company changes on your behalf uh, throughout the year, LawPath as your appointed ASIC agent can reach out to ASIC and make those changes, whether it's a change in uh, company shareholding, a change in officer address, etc. We can make those changes on your behalf as well. Uh, and again, there is discounted fixed price quotes if you have further accounting work. So this is a, a verbal advice and a high level strategic advice plan. If you do need bookkeeping, you want a resident directorship services, we have plenty of things they can offer and you can discuss that with them, which does fall outside of the scope of the plan. Uh, but again, this one does include unlimited 30 minute calls with our accountants and our lawyers as well. The lawyers and the accountants, they do speak to each other about your business. So they do have an overview of what's been discussed and that allows them to give more specific and targeted advice during your consultations. Now, both these plans as well, they do include an accelerator program, which again, if you have more uh, reactive needs, things that pop up from time to time, again, book in a call within one business day. In most cases, you can be speaking with a lawyer. Uh, or an accountant, but if you do want to take a more proactive stance and you're looking to say you just purchased the business, looking to raise capital, looking to redo the employment contracts, look at the privacy and insurance policies, uh, supplier and vendor relationships and business structure, these can all be reviewed through our accelerator program, which is complementary on these plans. So just taking a quick look at the 2023 budget boost for business as well. So all of our plans here, as you can see, the four main plans we have, these are tax deductible at 120%. Uh, there were some changes in the budget last year and LawPath as a Australian digital service provider does qualify for these extra tax deductions, which again is running up until the 30th of June for businesses less than 50 million in turnover. So for example, if you sign up for our legal advice plan uh, at 1440, you can deduct that at 1728, which means there's more money back in your pocket. You can also claim the GST through your BAS to receive a bit of a rebate and make the plan a bit cheaper. So for everyone on today's webinar, we are doing a special offer of 25% off our legal advice plan. Uh, so normally, again, on the previous slide, it is $120 a month. We have the discount that does bring it down to $90 a month or when paid annually as well. So if you'd like to take up this offer, please key yes into the chat now and one of our team will be in touch with you. If you would prefer a monthly payment option, we do have these options as well. And if you are on a plan or a service, potentially you're on a virtual office or a legal documents plan and you'd like to upgrade, uh, we do have some special offers available for you. So feel free to key yes into the chat and one of our team will reach out this afternoon. So now I'm just gonna see if there's any questions. Uh, we've still got Sam on the line here. If anyone has questions regarding business sale, business purchase, I know Mark Sinsom has a question on uh, valuing and treating goodwill, and we've got some other questions in here as well. So I'll invite Sam back to the stage uh, to answer these Q and A's. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, Mark, you've got a question. How do you treat and value goodwill? Um, there's some degree of uncertainty, I think is the correct answer. Um, don't quote me on this not being a valuer, but uh, I've seen it um, typically treated by rev or valued, I guess I'm guessing you're saying, um, by, by reference to revenue and WIP, um, but 
how, how SAS do you do that? Uh, have a have a chat to either an account or a uh, an experienced business valuer. Um, anonymous attendee, uh, got a fairly long question. Let me just read this first. Um, okay, so the question is, uh, seller insists that the contract is for, is for the sale of a going concern and indicates that on the contract. Um, and then it was later determined that the sale should have been subject to GST due to the business not operating for three months prior to the signing of the contract. Who will be liable for the GST in that situation? Uh, so... It really depends on what the contract says. So the contract should have a clause talking about how GST is to be treated. Um, now, if the contract is, well, the contract shouldn't be silent, to be frank. Um, but I think the, if I recall correctly, the New South Wales Law Society standard form contract, uh, unless if you specifically tick the box saying that um, the purchase price includes GST, Oh, sorry, uh, saying that the uh, purchase price is, is GST, not exclusive. Um, and it's been, it's been some months since I've seen one. Um, then the purchase price is taken to include GST and the, and the vendor, I'm presuming the vendor will have, then have to remit it to, to the ATO. Um, but it, it ultimately depends on what the contract says. The, the contract should have a clause um, dealing with uh, who is liable for GST if GST is assessed as being payable. Um, and uh, if you look at the standard form contracts that are issued by various conveyancing um, associations and law societies in different states, and every 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 state tends to have its own standard form contract that are then modified, um, there will there will usually be a default selection of that contract for, for whether the purchase price includes GST or excludes GST, and then you you basically follow what the contract says. But yeah, to to tricky sort of a question. Um, I'm not sure under GST law whether the vendor would be liable in the first instance. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, that's a really tricky situation. And a, a good reason for getting a lawyer to review the contract before, before signing on to it as well. All right. Um, let's just check the chat. And I think that's about it. I'll hand you back on to Ryan, over to Ryan for that. Thank you, Sam. And thank you to everyone who attended today's presentation. Uh, we have had a few questions on the slides. We do upload these webinars to YouTube, so you will find it by the end of the week. Just Google Law Path space YouTube. You'll see all of our past webinars, uh, which again, the full video is there. You can see the slides on the video as well. Uh, everything that we've covered in the last one to two years, uh, Sam, Damon, and all the presenters, as well as a, a range of bespoke and niche videos that a few of the lawyers have filmed as well.